Welcome back to Oak Haven. It's the middle of January. We're in Southwest Ohio, and that means the middle of winter for us. So as we walk through the woods, it obviously looks very different than it does in the spring, in the summer, in the fall. Uh, most of the trees have gone dormant, so it uh, has a very different look. I like the winter, because um, as you look around, particularly with no honeysuckle around, you can get a feel for the lay of the land a little bit. So um, I kind of like it. It gives me some space. Um, but it's, it's very different. You know, in the summer we walk by and we see trees and we think we know what they are because we look at the leaves. And when we see the leaves, we recognize them and we think, okay, well, I know what that tree is based on the leaves. In the winter, the leaves are gone and things start to look kind of the same. So uh, what we thought we would do is start a, a, um, a series on winter tree identification. We would go through, we've got over 40 different kinds of trees that, uh, that grow on our property here, the 60 acre parcel. So we didn't want to dump all of that on you at one time. So we've divided it up into smaller sections. Uh, luckily for you, today we're going to start with the easy things. So we're just going to, to go over some uh, of the easiest things to recognize out in the woods. Uh, things that... So generally, uh, winter tree identification involves using a hand lens and looking at the buds and looking at leaf scars and it gets pretty um, detailed. Uh, what we wanted to start off with was uh, some plants or trees that you can recognize just as you're walking by. You don't have to look all that closely that there, there are not a lot of things that would be uh, confusing for them. So let's go for a walk. So we're going to start with something pretty easy here. Uh, again, we're in southwest Ohio. So where we live, the, the trees that we have may be different from the trees that you have. Most of the trees that we're going to talk about are found throughout the eastern United States, but there may be some differences. Where we are, the only evergreen tree that we have is the eastern red cedar. So we don't have white pine or spruces or some other things that you may have in your areas. But if, if you see out in the woods a needle-bearing tree with green in the winter, you're pretty sure that it's a, a Eastern red cedar. Uh, red, Eastern red cedar is not actually a cedar, it's a juniper, uh, Juniperus virginiana. So if you look up in the tree, you see that the, the needles are green. They do turn kind of a bronzy color during the winter, so they don't look as, as, as deep green as they do during the summer. Um, but these, these needles will actually go to that bronzy color and then those same needles will turn back to green in the next summer. Uh, Eastern red cedar has two different kinds of needles. When it's young, they have more of a, a needle-like, spike-like look. Um, as the tree gets older, it, it has more, the needles are more uh, overlapping scales. I'll put in some pictures of that so you can see what that looks like. Uh, so you'll see on the really small saplings, you know, one to four years old, you may see more of the needle-like, they look really spiky. And then as the tree gets bigger, you'll see the overlapping scales where you don't see the, the, um, the, the spiky ones except on maybe new growth on an older tree. <clears throat> so that's the eastern red cedar. The, the bark is really um, peeling. It peels off like this. Cedar is known for being rot resistant. Uh, we use it around here. We'll cut up the logs and, and lay them out to put firewood on. People use cedar for uh, housing, for siding, and things like that. Um, they use uh, cedar because moths don't like it. They'll use it uh, for cedar chests, cedar closets, things like that. Uh, cedar was the thing that pencils were made out of, you know, years and years ago. They don't really do that as much anymore. Um, but a very useful wood. Very useful, but it is kind of a weedy tree. It tends to grow in uh, open areas. It likes the sun. So if an area has been disturbed, cedar is a pioneer species that grows up and, uh, and will reclaim an area. Once a, once a wood starts filling in, like what we have here, you end up with what we have here, which is, you can see the, the lower branches are all starting to die. Uh, it, it can't handle the shade of the woodland very much. So, as, a, as the woods uh, matures, the cedars will start to die off, and you'll see less and less of them, and other trees, the, the oaks, the hickories, the beeches, um, which are more shade tolerant, will, will take over and become more dominant.
Well, I was hoping I could show you some berries in the trees. Uh, cedars are dioecious. Dioecious means two houses. Die meaning two. Aecious comes from the, the Greek meaning houses, meaning that there's male trees and there's female trees. The male trees produce um, little cones that produce pollen. Female trees produce fruit. They get these uh, blue fruit. The fruit are very important to wildlife. There's over 40 species of birds that will eat the, uh, the cedar berries off of the, uh, the cedar trees, including cedar waxwings. Uh, as I look over this tree, or of the trees around here, I don't see any fruit. So I think that the birds by this time have already picked over all of the fruit and they're gone. So this is another tree that keeps its leaves through the winter, although it's not an evergreen. This is an American beech. And as you can see, the leaves, while they die, they don't fall off the, the tree. They're persistent. They stay through the, the winter. Now, the, the theories as to why they would keep their leaves like this, <clears throat> no one's sure exactly. But they have done research to find out that deer are less likely to browse on these uh, branches that have all these leaves on it. They don't want these little, not very nutritious leaves. They're interested in the buds. So uh, it, it would discourage deer from browsing, possibly. Let me show you the buds, because the buds of beech, I said we weren't going to talk about buds, we're going to talk about buds a little bit. The buds are very unique. They are very pointed and come away from the stem up at an angle. Now, I always thought that the, uh, the buds of beech looked like a, a cigar, so our, our kids learned beech trees by the phrase don't smoke cigars at the beach. So there you go, you can remember that the cigar-shaped buds are the beech tree. Beech also have a very smooth bark. Makes it very popular for people that want to carve initials in their, their trees. Um, <clears throat> it, it's pretty unique for other trees in the area. There are other trees that hold on to their, their leaves. Uh, oaks have a tendency to hold on to their leaves. The hornbeams hold on to their leaves. But nothing holds onto their leaves that's this golden color. Uh, you can see it from, you know, a long way away in the woods. So when I was talking about cedars, I mentioned that they're not very uh, shade tolerant. Beeches are kind of uh, one of the kings of, of shade tolerance. So you find a lot of small beeches that can grow and uh, the saplings will grow and they can grow up into adulthood within a mature forest. That's why beeches tend to be a climax species around here. When you find a mature woods, you'll, you'll, find, you'll still find the beeches growing up tall. We're going to go over here to another tree that has an interesting bark. Hey. So another tree that's easy to identify in the winter is this giant. <clears throat> this is one of the largest trees in the eastern uh, deciduous forest here. So if you look at the bark here, there's pretty much bark on the bottom here. It looks in pretty good shape. And as you start to move up, you see that the, the bark is flaking off. It almost looks sick. It almost looks like it has leprosy or something like that. And as you move up the tree, more bark is flaking off. And it looks sicker and sicker. So you keep going up. And it looks more sick, and more sick, and more sick, and more sick, a more sick, a more sick, a more sick, a more. And there you go, a cheesy way to remember that this tree is a sycamore, the American sycamore tree. Boy, we had to work hard on that one. So sycamore tend to do this. They, they get big, they're, they're one of the biggest, the bulkiest trees in the woods. Not necessarily the tallest, but they often rot in the inside. So you'll find huge sycamores that are all hollowed out on the inside. You know, early American history, you'll hear stories of people who made their first cabins living in inside of sycamores or spending time inside of sycamores. Sycamores in the summer are easily recognized because they have also one of the biggest simple leaves of our trees. Huge leaves coming in from the sycamore trees. Sycamores, as you find here, it's kind of in a, a drainage swale. So as you're driving along the road, watch for sycamores. You almost always see them along uh, rivers, along creeks, or along ditches. So the buds of sycamore are fairly unique. 
Um, unfortunately, they're often way up at the top of a tree, so they're not very useful unless you're looking at small little trees. So sycamore buds have one scale covering them, protecting them. Remember, a bud is the, the young leaves or flowers that are, are uh, develop in the fall and they're protected during the winter uh, and will open up in the spring. So there's one scale covering up that leaf and it tends to be a reddish color. So another tree that you can see as you look through the woods that has a pretty rough bark is this tree with this dark, almost black bark. This is black cherry. Very distinctive. The, the um, bark looks like it's peeling off in little flakes. Uh, people have likened this to to uh, black cornflakes or burnt cornflakes. So if you took a tree and you you glued black cornflakes over it, it would look kind of like black cherry. Kimber is having a field day here because it's snow and she's like, I can run around in the snow. <clears throat> Our cat Cayenne is not so happy about this and is wondering why we're out walking through the snow. <clears throat> so black cherry um, is also a tree, kind of like the cedars, where it's not very shade tolerant. So it, uh, it will grow up in open areas, and then as the, the uh, woods mature, it starts to get less healthy and sicker and it will eventually die. <clears throat> um, trees that are growing in the woods tend to lose all of their lower branches. So if you look at this tree, you can go up probably 30 feet before you hit the first branch. And the reason for that is that if a tree can't absorb much, um, <clears throat> much sunlight through the forest canopy, there's no sense for it to have those trees, those leaves and those branches. So it, it self prunes, it loses those lower branches. And then as it continues to put on girth, as it continues to grow uh, wider and wider, it produces wood that doesn't have knots in it. It doesn't have the knots where branches would be. That's where you get good cherry wood for furniture or for other things. Cherry obviously is very prized for its wood. It's the second most popular wood for woodworking and for furniture uh, behind black walnut. And as it, uh, it, it creates that, that clear wood without the, the branches, it makes it just more, that much more valuable. So as you're approaching, notice how these black cherries stand out against the rest of the tree trunks. They are so much darker and just look very different. Okay, our next tree, you have to look a little closer because it is a bark issue that, that will identify this tree. <clears throat> this is a hackberry tree. Hackberry has the most unique bark. It is so cool. Because if you come in close here, you can see that it looks like, people have said that it looks like a, a topographic map, or it looks like the sedimentary deposits from uh, along the Grand Canyon. You can imagine if you were a little person running through here, it would look like you were uh, walking through the Grand Canyon. Just layer after layer of these corky layers on the, on the bark. And that makes up hackberry. Hackberry, it, I, I appreciate the fact that it, it shows how trees grow and how bark works. You can see that the, the bark is laid down in layer after layer after layer. Just like, as you can imagine, the trees, the, the wood of the tree is laid in layer after layer after layer that we call the rings of the tree. <clears throat> That's the xylem tissue. Outside the xylem tissue is the phloem tissue and then other uh, corky tissue that makes up the bark. As a tree grows, the xylem tissue is getting grow growing bigger and bigger and bigger, the, the wood part, and it's pushing the phloem and the, the, uh, the corky bark layer out to the point where it, it starts to crack up. That's All of bark is <clears throat> just an indication of how the, each individual tree has, has come to, to grips with the fact that the tree is growing from the inside out. It's pushing that bark out and it's starting to crack up on the outside. Think of it like a balloon. And if you painted a balloon with paint and then blew it up more, you can imagine how the paint would start to crack up. That's exactly what's happening on the bark. Some bark splits apart and you see it looking kind of sinuous. Some bark bark uh, does this where it, it cracks up and you can see the, the, the lines in it. Some bark like the, um, the black cherry. You can see where the, those 
individual plates. They're kind of separating out, almost like you would imagine uh, plates uh, in plate tectonics um, on the, the Earth's crust separating out as, as the, the mantle expands. Um, that's, what, that's what's happening at the bark. So you can imagine that the tree is growing and the bark is just like cracking up as the tree continues to grow. So our last tree that we're going to talk about is again a very obvious tree. If you look at this tree here, look at these thorns. This is honey locust. Honey locust has these amazing, big, nasty looking thorns on it. It's one of the few trees that we have that have thorns on it, and it's the only one that I can think of that has thorns that come out of the, the trunk like this. Uh, it also has this, this bark that kind of peels off. It looks like it, uh, like somebody was like tore off sections of it. So why, do, why does a, a honey locust have these nasty thorns on here? So let me step back. All plants, their goal in life is to produce more plants. So honey locust produces, it's in the, it's in the leguminosae, the, the, uh, the uh, legume family or the pea family. So it produces long pods of seeds with a sweet pulp around the, the, uh, the seeds. That's where the honey comes from uh, that animals like to eat. That's good for, for trees because they would like animals to eat their, their seed pods, walk off a distance away from the, the parent tree, and deposit the seeds in their poop and spread their, their seeds all over the place. It's important for the tree that it is not damaged by whatever it is that's eating the, the seeds and that, it's, uh, that the seeds are allowed to, to um, ripen on the tree to the point where if when they're spread around they're ready to to uh, to germinate so if you look at this this honey locust tree it's got these nasty spikes on it what is that trying to keep away so there's researchers that have come up with the idea that the, the honey locust tree evolved at a time when this area had mastodon so mastodon are huge you know, elephant-like creatures that lived here in this part of the world up until about 10,000 years ago when they were uh, probably hunted to extinction by uh, Paleolithic, uh, you know, Native Americans. Um, so picture a 15-foot mastodon coming here. They ate uh, trees and shrubs and, and branches. So the honey locust is protected from the mastodon coming and eating the trees it, the mastodon can't take the, the uh, seeds down until they're ripened and they've fallen on the ground. So that's the theory, is that these trees are, look so nasty because of a time when there were mastodons. Now we don't have mastodons, it still has its leaves. But think about that. It's so cool to look around the woods and think about what it would be to have mastodons walking around. I think that's amazing. Okay, here we have our one and only evergreen. What is that? So this is the Eastern Red Cedar. Okay, here we have this tree. It's losing all of its bark. What do we have here? It's looking kind of sickly. Here's your sycamore. Okay, I grab onto this. This is really rough. I look up it. I imagine I'm going through uh, the Grand Canyon here. What is it? This is hackberry. Okay, coming over to this tree. Much darker bark than everything else around. Corn flaky like bark. What is it? That's our black cherry. So even though we're 40 feet away, we've got a tree out here with persistent leaves. They're golden in color, smooth bark, buds that stand out, really thin, sharp buds, look like a cigar. 
That's our beech tree. And then we've got this tree. Look at those thorns. Crazy thorns. Keep even a mastodon away. What is this? This is the honey locust. Hopefully we've covered these trees in a way that you actually learn something and you'll remember it the next time you're out. Uh, you can share that with friends and tell others what you've learned. Ideally, if, if you like this video, if you learned something, share it with somebody that you'd like to, to maybe somebody that you go on walks with, that uh, you would like to learn this together with. It's, it's, it's always more fun to learn uh, when you're learning things together. So, you know, share it with your hiking partners or your family. Um, we always appreciate that. We always appreciate more uh, subscribers. Uh, if you like the video, hit the like button. Um, other than that, thanks for coming along.